Welcome back, everybody, for yet another episode of Lemon Alpha. This is Todd today. No, Joe. Just going to do some reaction video to Lululemon's earning this report and kind of walk you through my thinking on how the company's executing. Most people are familiar with Lululemon, athleisure wear, uh, mostly used. I mean, their, their whole concept is, hey, let's let's get active and let's start sweating together uh, type of motif. Um, they do business through stores. They do business direct. They are predominantly a North American company, but uh, they do business overseas too. So I just want to go through and sort of show you some of the things I'm looking to give you a reaction to what they reported for their first quarter earnings. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. And you'll notice I've got a couple uh, tabs open already up top here. The first one that we're going to look at is the 10K. And 10K is an annual report, comes out once a year, and it gives you a little bit more insight into their business. So you just can remind yourself a little bit about, okay, this is what the company does. This is um, how it makes its money. And I think this is always a great first step for investors who uh, are trying to research a company, can kind of like look at the 10K and uh, learn more about the company. So <clears throat> you can see that they say they're an experiential brand. Um, they help people sweat, grow, and connect, living the sweat life, which is really pretty cool. Um, comprehensive line of apparel and accessories. So again, clothing company here, pants, shorts, tops, jackets, designed for healthy lifestyle, makes sense. Best known obviously for their um, long lasting uh, yoga pants. So you look at the market, obviously it's an active lifestyle people. You look at their segment and you say, okay, well, in 2020, 38% of their revenue came from company operated stores. So these are the retail stores that are located in malls or in cities and storefronts. And 52% came from direct to consumer and then 10% from what they call the other segment. And then in 2019, uh, so this is 2020, the COVID year. And then 2019, pre-COVID, you can see that would look very different. 63% of the revenue came from company operated stores and only 29% came from direct to consumer. So the big thing that jumps out to me here is that, okay, we had <clears throat> pre-COVID heavy reliance on the actual storefront businesses, uh, less reliance on direct to consumer e-commerce business. 2020, understandably that changed. Company operating stores generated lower amount of revenue, direct to consumer sales took off. So the thing I'm gonna look for when I look at the earnings report is, What's the trend in direct to consumer versus the trend in company stores? Because, you know, we are starting to get vaccinated. People are getting back out again. People are spending money again. So let's see whether or not this pie that we're seeing can get bigger and, you know, maybe get a little bit better balance between company operated and direct to consumer over time. So you can see that they say they have 521 stores, <clears throat> excuse me, in 17 countries worldwide, 315 of those being in the United States, <clears throat> 62 in Canada, 521 total and opened 30 net new stores in 2020. So even the COVID year, they did operate open new stores. So it'll be interesting to see how, that's something too. You know, do they have plans to add more stores? Um, and if so, how many more stores? I mean, that, that's a great source of growth. You've got your organic growth, which is your same store sales. That's your year over year increase for a retailer. And then you have also, you know, new markets. So you open a new store in a new market and you build your business that way. Um, and, you know, 521 stores, that's, that sounds like a lot, but it, it really isn't. Um, especially if you're talking about a global company. And then it also says that in addition to selling the clothing, um, it also bought Mirror, which is in-home fitness through an interactive workout plan. You may have seen these advertised on the Super Bowl uh, weekend, et cetera. It's basically a big, you know, like a full length mirror uh, hangs on your wall in your workout room or wherever. You pay a subscription fee to access classes and you basically do these virtual classes using the mirror. So I am going to want to see what the uh, pace of growth looks like for mirror and hopefully they'll provide us with some insight in that in the um, in the meeting. And then, you know, I just want to go back and take a look. Okay, so actually this is good employees by region. So you can see, yeah, very dominated by the United States still in their businesses. Great. So we have a little bit of a background now. We have a couple things we want to look for. So let's pop over now to the actual earnings report. So, okay, 
first off, top line growth, 88% to 1.2 billion, diluted EPS of $1.11, uh, just EPS of $1.16. Let's go to Seeking Alpha's website, punch up Lululemon symbol, so L-U-L-U, -L uh, and no, I'm not getting paid by Seeking Alpha to, to hype their, their stuff. It's just that they have everything nicely put together as far as news flow. It's very quick and easy way for me to see whether or not um, companies are beating and, and be able to go through some of the stuff. So Lululemon EPS beats by 25 cents, beats on revenue. So let's open that up real quick. All right, so yeah, revenue of a dollar of uh, $1.23 billion was up 89% year over year. And that was better than analysts were expecting. So again, analysts, you have you know, a big company like Lululemon maybe has 20, 30 analysts that are following it. They will have their models. They're crunching them continuously to try and figure out, okay, guesstimate um, based on channel checks. Basically, you know, in the olden days, you would go into the store, count the number of cards, talk to management teams, whatever, try to get a good feel of how business is and then adjust your model. Um, so they beat that estimate by 100 million. And then if you look at the non-GAAP earnings per share of $1.16, they beat by 25 cents. So, you know, a beat in both places. And then they also give us our guidance here, but we'll get into that in a second when we're going through the actual earnings report. So I'm just gonna pivot back over to this earnings report out where you know that it was a beat on both the top and the bottom line. And again, that's important for a couple of different reasons because, you know, one of the main components of our Power 7 model that drives the service that we offer to, you know, individual investors and also, for the institutional business that I own, EV Capital, which serves portfolio managers and hedge funds, one of the key components of our Power 7 model is earnings beats. Because what we found over time is that companies that under-promise and over-deliver tend to get rewarded in, in, in higher share price. So I like to look and see if the company is beating. And ideally, you want to see three or at least three of the last four quarters having been a beat. So obviously, this is... This is good news that they beat on both the top and line, bottom line. All right, so Calvin McDonald's, this is their CEO. Our first quarter results strength across all drivers fueled by expansion of e-commerce. So even with things opening up, it looks like the e-commerce business was still uh, generating a lot of revenue and a rebound in brick and mortar stores. So that's kind of what I was talking about before. What I want to see is that pie actually getting bigger and maybe getting a little bit more balance over time to the revenue sources coming direct uh, to consumer versus the retail stores. Strong performance against cross categories, channels, and geographies, momentum and strength. Okay, just remember, whenever you're reading these um, press releases, management teams are going to hype up. They're going to put up top what they want you to see, right? <laughs> so, so just be aware that they're, they're, um, they're putting their best foot forward when they're making these comments. Um, so just you know, take everything that the management team says with just a little bit of green of salt. They're not lying. It's just that you know, obviously they're gonna, they're gonna talk about the things they wanna talk about. All right, company operated stores net revenue increased 106% to 537 million. Awesome, awesome. So you know, we did have the shutdown, but the shutdown really didn't get going until what, the tail end of the first quarter of 2020? So we're going first quarter of 2021 versus first quarter of 2020. And we're seeing the revenue doubled to the stores. I would assume that in quarter two, we're going to see a much larger increase in company operated store net revenue because a lot of the stores probably were closed in the second quarter of 2020. So the comparable is going to be very, very easy, but good. Good to see 106% growth to 537. And direct to consumer increased 55%. All right. So that's that's also very healthy, uh, but it certainly does suggest that, you know, okay, um, more people may be stepping out, like to go in the store and kind of peruse, see what they've got in, in, in the cubbies on the walls and sitting on the racks. Um, direct to consumer still healthy though, up 55%. That's a good pretty good for a retailer. I mean, that's, that's pretty good to 545. And you'll notice one of the things that jumps out to me again was that the size of the pie and kind of the normalizing the split between e-commerce and in-store. And we're pretty pretty even, 545 for the e-commerce business and 536 for the company operated stores. Uh, if you look at the net revenue, sales were up 82% in North America and 125% internationally. 
All right. So direct to consumer, that's the e-commerce was 44% of total net revenue compared to 54% in the first quarter of 2020. Again, that makes sense because as the stores um, are, are, are opening, you should, you should see them ac ac um, accounting for a larger percentage. Gross profit, okay, up 109%. That's good. Income from operations, 492% to 194 million. Adjusted income from operations, 479% to 205. Well, that's a lot. Op oh, and this is why. Your operating margin increased uh, over 10%, almost 11% to 15.8% in adjusted operating margin to 16.4. I always look at year over year revenue change, um, year over year comparison of, of operating margins, um, because operating margins are gonna show you whether or not there's leverage in the business. So sales are growing. You also wanna see the operating uh, margin increase because that means that the increase in sales is being leveraged against you know, fixed costs like SG&A, selling general administrative costs that shouldn't necessarily um, scale near anywhere near as quickly as revenue. Um, because these are just the things that, that you know, are more oriented towards fixed expenses. Uh, delivering your share or dollar 11 versus 22 cents. Bought back a couple shares. Opened two net stores in the quarter to finish with 523, which makes sense given the, what we were seeing previously in the 10K. All right, so that's all pretty straightforward here. I, I like what I'm seeing here. Balance sheet highlights 1.2 billion in cash equivalents. Yep, yep, yep. And then the 2021 outlook. Okay, so second quarter of 2021, we expect revenue to be 1.3 to 1.33 billion. So let's pop over to my chart service. And you can see that in the April quarter, that's when we're just talking about now, uh, revenue was up at 88%. And in the quarter ending July 31, it was only up 2%. Okay, so this is the quarter that they're now guiding for. In that quarter, they did 903 million and they're guiding for 1.3 billion. So an extra 400 million increase. So, you know, 40 to 50% growth year over year is what they're forecasting. Uh, dilute earnings expected to be range of $1.05 and they earned 74 cents. So up, up more. They expect earnings to grow faster than revenue. And revenue in the full year 2021, 5.8 billion. Okay. And 652 to 665 in earnings per share. All right. So that's all pretty solid. Let's go over now to Seeking Alpha again. And let's take a look at the earnings call transcript. And there's a couple of different things I want to just see here. So you can get these transcripts in many different sites. Motley Fool has them, Seeking Alpha has them. Um, so first thing I'm gonna type in is, I'm gonna type in mirror. Because one of the questions that we had, that I had looking at that 10K was to see if I could get some sort of a feel for whether or not um, mirror sales are increasing or um, maybe they're not because people are going back to Planet Fitness. So touching on mirror, we continue to be pleased with the performance of it and the opportunities within at home. Strong Mother's Day and remains on track to deliver 250 million to 275 million in revenue in 2021. So looks like they're gonna do a quarter of a billion dollars in sales in 2021, despite reopening and people getting back into gyms. Mirror will be featured in nearly 90 Lululemon locations. So they're not even fully marketing Mirror yet. And they're going to do 200 shop and shops in time for the holidays. So by the time we get into the fourth quarter, it looks like they'll really be much more aggressively marketing. Um, I think we saw, what, 300 and change in North American stores. And we're going to see 200 shop and shops to highlight Mirror. So they're definitely making a, a push in Mirror to see if we can grow. Adding more classes and expanding into Canada, which will be the first um, first market for Canada. All right, so let's let's take a look at this international. There's two other things I want to look at for this earnings reaction. The first is the international growth. Very pleased with results and growth potential across three regions of China, Asia Pacific, and e EMEA. Um, just quick note: to, they have more of all of the store locations. I think that their biggest international exposure outside of Canada is China. And then followed by that is Australia. So that's good to know. 
from our new stores in China, continued growth in Asia Pacific. Again, we this is going to be kind of lumpy on the international side because I'm not really sure how this is all going to play out with um, uneven back you know, uneven vaccination levels and how quickly people are overseas or getting back into stores, et cetera. So I think that's good. Um, let's see if they mentioned the men's business because that's the other thing that I want to take a look at. You know, this is predominantly became well known as a women's clothing business. And only a couple of years ago, they started to expand into a men's business, a uh, business, I'm sorry, a men's uh, clothing line. So I think I read in previously that there's a, a think of, still the, most of the sales come from the women's, um, you know, I think it's like in the 60 percentiles uh, coming from women. So I just wanted to see what they're saying about men's. So two year, da, 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 we said double digit growth line model of the regions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Saw broad based strength across merchandise category with women's, men's and accessories all growing more than 20% on a two year basis. That's good. So that's good to see. Let's see if they say anything else about men's. Let's see here, investments, investments, oh uh, yeah. When you, I just do a control F so I can, you know, go through really quickly. It really doesn't provide us um, much more color in this. We may have to wait for the 10Q to drop just to see if they give us more of a breakdown on um, the men's and the women's. Okay, so yeah, they really don't, they really don't say a whole heck of a lot uh, other than it's a good business to be in and they're gonna grow it. I think that the men's business um, is actually a, a really good opportunity for growth and expansion, revenue expansion for this company. And if you get a chance, um, go into one of their stores and take a look at um, what they have for, for inventory on the men's side. Um, so, okay, so that, that, that's, that's that. Uh, so I, th I think that's pretty much it as far as taking a look at the earnings. I mean, we did see very rapid growth. We're seeing a normalization uh, between revenue, between stores. Oh, let's take a look real quick and see if they had mentioned new stores. Uh, I want to ask a follow-up a real estate decision to accelerate some of this new store openings. What's giving you confidence, that confidence there? I'm just reading through here. Yeah, so it looks like they are going to open up more stores. Three to four thousand to five to six thousand range in square feet. And again, you know, it looks like they um, they're going to be opening new stores in China and elsewhere. So we want to see that continue and see them expand their footprint in stores. So, I, I mean, I think it's, it's really hard to tear this thing apart because you've got a company that um, is growing significantly over 100% growth in the retail stores, uh, still getting 50% plus growth in the e-commerce business. You've got the potential to expand their business by attracting more men into the stores, which I think is important. You've got an opportunity to grow overseas with new store locations overseas. Um, and then of course, you know, and you've got Mirror and the potential to go to 200 stores showcasing Mirror for the fourth quarter. I think that the next two quarters, it's gonna be important to watch these trends, right? To see whether or not we can get more insight into the men's business and if that's actually running pretty well. Um, Will this also allow for an opportunity to go into kids' clothing at some point? I mean, I suppose there is, right? Um, so let's let's keep let's keep our eyes on this. I think overall this was a really good quarter for Lululemon. Um, I'm a I'm a shareholder, and uh, I'm going to continue to hold on to my shares. I think there's nothing there that scares me off and makes me want to get rid of my shares in Lululemon. All right, thanks again. Talk to you soon.